Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here, Congressman. We're just thrilled to have you. Tell me, why did you want to deploy with the National Guard, and what did you learn from this experience? Well, th thanks so so much for having me, all of you. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, as is my entire family. Look, anything that I just did over the last two weeks, while it was an incredible privilege, is nothing compared to the incredible service that I saw. Um, you, you all spoke about in your last segment, searching for optimism in, these, in this day and age. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you can find it right out there on the front lines. You know, I served alongside uh, do doctors who, uh, you know, had lost family, whose family was sick, and they were still soldiering on. Um, nurses who hadn't had the opportunity to hug their children in weeks, if not more than a month. And I remember on the, the last huddle before we saw the, the first patient at this COVID-only facility that this extraordinary team had built and established in less than a week that you saw the soldiers in their own uniform, many of whom had deployed more than a few times, applauded the first-line medical professionals. These are the soldiers in this new war, and just that moment, where people aren't thinking about political differences, so, they're not thinking about divides, they're just getting the job done, that gives you all the faith that you need in this country that we're gonna beat this virus. So what do you, what do you say to your fellow Congress folks with the military experience? You think they'll follow your lead and, and help to keep this ubulance going? Well, I'll tell you what I am advocating for, and I'm certainly not the only one. This is an operational problem at this point, and there's a clear role that the federal government has got to play, as well as a clear role for states and cities. But there are certain things that only the federal government can get done, and, and with presidential leadership, and that's centered around production of these critical supplies that we need, the PPE to protect our medical professionals, the reagents, the lab equipment, the swabs. We need millions upon millions of these items so we can ramp up testing, ramp up antibody testing, do the contact tracing, so we can open up this economy, albeit gradually, because it's true, people are suffering economically. Um, and we have got to work our hardest to allow for people to get back out there safely, albeit, and start providing for their families again and make sure that we have the hospital-based infrastructure behind them so that we can continue to aid the sick as well as protect those who are the most vulnerable. Congressman, this is Megan. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service in our military and all that you're doing right now. We're all very Absolutely. grateful. You are an Army veteran with a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star as you served in Afghanistan. And you recently said that you agree with President Trump comparing this virus to a war. So how do you think it compares and should that inform our response? It absolutely should inform our response. And in many ways, it's more analogous with World War II than it is even with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, not to ever reduce the incredible sacrifices that uh, our soldiers made in the 21st century. But in World War II, it was more of an instance of total war, where we had to utilize the full manufacturing capacity of the United States. And this requires the president to step in assert all of the powers underlying the Defense Production Act, as he did in the Korean War, for instance, to make sure that there's no shortage of these critical supplies that we need. And there's a lot of complexity around this, but it does boil down to the simple fact that the free market alone won't solve this problem, that many companies who make all of these critical supplies are saying, well, I don't know if I'm gonna build that second factory or that third factory, because I don't know if this demand will be there a year from now. The federal government can step in and guarantee purchases for several years to come. Worst case is that those purchases go towards a reserve. It's things like that. But there's another element of war that I think is even more important right now, and that is the solidarity that comes during a wartime, where people are not thinking about ways to divide each other, but they're thinking about ways in which we can unite. That's what makes this the greatest country in the history of the world. It's how we sent a man to the moon. It's how we won World War II, won the Cold War. And it's 
how we're going to beat this. And I have more confidence than ever that we can get that done. Now, Congressman, you've said nothing would make you happier than seeing the president be successful in beating uh, COVID-19, even if it means him winning re-election. Uh, what does the president need to do right now that uh, he has not done? Yeah, well, well, first of all, let me, let me just speak to the larger politics of this. After Barack Obama won his first election, Mitch McConnell stood up and said his singular priority is to make sure that this president doesn't win re-election. I'm never going to stoop down to that level. During every moment of significant crisis in this country, it is required presidential leadership. We all know that the president has to step up and utilize the full powers available to him as commander in chief. Um, he, re he asserted the Defense Production Act yesterday for swabs. I think that is exactly the type of thing that we need to see more of, and we can't think about politics right now. We can't think about an election. We have to just think about the future of this country and beating this virus. We need to dramatically expand testing to the point where we're doing millions of tests per day for both antibodies and the virus. We need to have significantly expanded hospital infrastructures in place in the event of a second surge. Let's not forget in the history of pandemics, it's often the second surge, which is even more severe than the first. And then lastly, we have to think about how are we going to protect those people who we're now right. calling essential workers. They were always essential. The cops and firemen and teachers and nurses and people working in right. supermarkets and the transit workers, so many of whom live in my district. Thought. We've got to be there for them. 